So I want to ask you, uh, how do you make spiritual conclusions in your life? If someone were to come up to you, for instance, and, and say, introduce a brand new perspective on how Jesus will come back, or, or maybe how the United States will fit into Bible prophecy, or what happens to us when we die, how do you determine an idea's truthfulness, whether it, it is actually true or not? Well, I want to share two stories to illustrate how not to evaluate these ideas. The Tsar of Russia was standing at the palace window one morning and he noticed a sentry standing guard in a remote section of the garden. His curiosity began to get to him, so he approached the young sentry. Why are you here, soldier? The Tsar asked. Well, I'm standing guard, sir, the sentinel answered nervously. Did you start today? Oh, no, sir, I've been guarding here for a long time. Well, what, is it, what are you guarding? Well, I don't know, sir. You, you don't know. He threw up his arms in disbelief, and he said, I want the captain right now. So in a matter of minutes, the captain was now standing before the czar, and he said, Captain, just what is this soldier guarding? I don't know, your, uh, sir, was his surprising answer as well. The orders are that a sentry will be posted here at this very spot 24 hours a day, and we have been following those very orders faithfully. Well, I want you to search the archives of the palace guard because I want to know why we're standing here, standing here at our post. Well, the research into the guard records finally uncovered the answer. When Catherine the Great had been ruler of Russia, a dignitary from one of the European countries had come to visit and as a sign of friendship had presented her with a rare rose bush for the royal rose garden. The bush was planted and Catherine had given orders that a sentry be posted around the clock to prevent any tampering. But see, there was a problem. Catherine the Great and her beautiful rose bush had been dead for over 100 years. And yet the rose bush had been covered with a sentry guard 24 hours a day ever since. But never, no one ever knew why. And sometimes we accept ourselves certain ideas based on the fact that it's always been fact and no one's ever challenged that fact ever before. Another story I read was about a Midwest man in the 1800s. He wanted to build a family farm. And so he drew out plans in the greatest of detail and he finally called his eldest son to him and he said, I, I want to tell you something, son. I'm going to be leaving here to Europe for a year but I'm going to give you all the funds you need. Here are the plans. I've planned them out in the greatest precise detail. Please follow the instructions as I've given to, the, to you, and in a year's time, I will return. And when I come back, we can get the family farm going. The son said he would do everything as instructed, so the man left on his trip. So the son started looking over the plans, and he looked at first the, the plans for the house. Well, the design was great. It was, it was no different than he would have chosen. He was impressed with the, how beautiful the design was and where it was supposed to be located, right on the property in the right spot. So he built the house exactly as designed. Then he looked to the barn. Well, it was just the right size. He couldn't believe it. This is exactly how he would build it. Just the right size for the animals and livestock that they had, the storage and the feed. And there were cables and pulleys, and it was designed just fine. And he liked it, and he approved of it. And so he went ahead and, and did the work as assigned. But then he noticed something that was a little off. There was one flaw in the plan, and that was the placement of the well. It was on a steep grade. It was a great distance from the house, and the son, knowing that he had always carried the water before, would have to be carrying it again, said, this is not going to work. And so he, he rearranged things a little bit, built the well a little closer to the house so that he wouldn't have to carry the water quite so far. He knew the father would be pleased, but especially proud of the change of the well. My question for you this morning is, when did the boy stop obeying the father? Was it when he moved the well away from the plans? Was it with the barn or the home? I would propose to you that he never obeyed the father in the first place. See, every step he took, he, would, he took first recognizing whether he approved of the plan or not. As long as he agreed with the father, he went along with it. But once there was disagreement, the son did what he wanted to do. There was not a submission to the will or the authority of his father. His heart was seeking self-fulfillment. And how many times do we do that to God? 
we're okay with his plans if those plans are okay with us. But when we're challenged, when we want something else, then we want to see things differently. And this story shows us how we might think we're obeying God, but really we're only doing those things we ourselves agree with. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7, 21 to 23, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord and Lord, we have prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, performed many miracles in your name, but I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Now for the next few weeks, we're going to look at the Sabbath. That's a controversial topic in and of itself. And you may wonder, why study the Sabbath? Why is it such a big deal? Well, I, I was in a, uh, before the Seventh-day Baptist, I was with another uh, denomination, another Sabbatarian denomination, and they often had uh, talks about the Sabbath talk, uh, and studies from the pulpit and Bible study uh, almost at least once a month, if not more. Well, perhaps that's a little too much discussion about one specific topic in Scripture, but it's important that we discuss it fairly often. Why is that? Well, the Seventh-day Sabbath is in our name. We're seventh day Baptist. So it's a part of who we are. And, and it's a part of who we are as individuals, as families, as, as a church group. People want to know why we choose to worship differently than the majority of other Christians. Why do you go to church on Saturday? Now I will jokingly say that I only know of uh, one difference between a Saturday Baptist and a Sunday Baptist and, and that basically is that uh, uh, they miss out on um, Professional, foot, uh, professional football, and we miss out on college football. But there's more to it than that. Why do we go to church on Saturday? Some of us in this gathering uh, came to know Maranatha because of people or invitations or whatever. We didn't come because of the Sabbath. We just happened to experience the Sabbath. But why? Why is it such a big deal? Um, some have told me, other pastors have told me, you know, Maranatha would grow so much bigger, so much faster if you would just move it to Sunday because that's when other folks know to go to church. Why is it on Saturday? So it's important for ourselves, it's important for those that uh, we talk to to know why uh, and or is the seventh day uh, Sabbath important. Now next week we're going to look at how the Sabbath was kept and how it was abused by the Old Testament believers. And then we'll look at how the Sabbath was treated in the New Testament. But our final week together, now that one should prove to be the most interesting because we're going to take a serious look at some of the most challenging critiques. If you've been a Sabbatarian for very long, you've probably heard some of these. How can we know that the Sabbath we have today is the same one that God honored in the first place? Or maybe wasn't the Seventh-day Sabbath for the Jew only? It wasn't meant for the Christian today? Or the statement that Jesus changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Or we now keep Sunday instead of Sabbath because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Or I keep every day holy, not just one. Or to say that uh, Sunday is the Lord's day. Or finally, can't I just keep one day in seven to please God? It doesn't matter to him, I'm sure, whether it's Tuesday or Saturday or, sa or Friday. But first, before we look at those things, we really need to look at something as a foundation for our study. So I, I hope you'll bear with me. Today's a little deep in theology. Um, I'm going to try to make it as light as possible. But today, we're going to look at the, uh, uh, directly at the law and, and at grace and in how they relate to each other and how they relate to us as Christians today. And somebody may ask, well, why put so much emphasis on the law? Doesn't that just lead to legalism? We say legalism and instantly, I, I can't even say the word without there, there, this, this facial contortion coming up. Legalism has such a negative to it. But legalism just means focus on the law, on the legal things. And they're like so many things, fire and other things. There are healthy forms of legalism and there are unhealthy forms of legalism. As long as we are focused. Now surely seeing the law as our salvation is a wrong focus. But this is what Paul said in Romans 7. I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had said, you shall not covet. So when he mentions the coveting, where's that coming from? Directly from the Ten Commandments, right? One of the Ten Commandments. 
He's saying you can't know what sin is unless you read and understand God's law. James said it this way, For if you listen to the word and you don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and you forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. You guys like mirrors? I hate mirrors. I hate mirrors with a passion. Because every time I look into one, it's not the vision of who I wanted to be. Without a mirror, here's what I imagine myself to look like today. The next slide, please. There, right there. That's what George looks like without a mirror. I really thought there'd be a lot more affirmation from you guys this morning. Apparently there's not, but that's okay. However, with a mirror, this is more about what I see. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there comes the affirmation. Great. That's not when I need it. See, the law was never given to save us. The law is like a mirror. It points out our sins. It points out our flaws. It points out those things. We can lose that slide if you want. Um, But it points out all the terrible things in, in, in in our image. The law was given to point out sin and to define it, to bring it out of its hiding place and to show how monstrous it really, really is. Nothing shows the sinfulness of sin as much as the law itself does. And once a man has seen the real meaning of the law, he sees the sinfulness of his own nature every time he's exposed to it. Here's another misunderstood verse about the law. Romans chapter 10, verse 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Whoa, it's the end of the law. Does that mean, is Paul saying that Christ has ended the law? No. The word end here is the Greek word telos. And telos means the goal. Christ is the goal of the law. Here's another word with a verse with the word telos translated as end. James 5.11 says, You've heard of the perseverance of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. Does, Does that mean that God is no more? No, the end is the goal. It's the goal of the Lord. It's through the patience of Job that we can see the ultimate purpose of his patient suffering which is God and his will for our lives. Here's another response you may have if you talk, start talking about the law. Oh, I'm so sorry. Haven't you heard? We're no longer under the law, but we're under grace. Well, the reality is, uh, reality is I should say, that is scriptural. It comes from Romans 6.14. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are what? Not under the law, but under grace. But what does it mean? Has God's law been canceled by God's grace? Did, it, did one overcome the other? Those who quote verse 14 usually misquote uh, the next verse, Romans 6, 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? By no means. See, Paul didn't say the law disappeared Paul was saying something totally different. Look at these other verses Paul wrote. Romans 3.31. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Romans 2.13. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Romans 7.22. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. I think it's obvious that Paul never meant to suggest that the law was done away with. Paul was trying to explain the delicate relationship between law and grace. In Facebook relationship terms, we'd put it, it's complicated. It's not easy to to balance between law and grace. So how are we both under the law and covered by his grace at the same time? I picture it kind of like this. The law is like a pouring rainstorm. It's always on all of us. We are all under the law. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, it's not a few of us. That's not some of us. It's not even most of us. It says all have fallen short of the glory of God and sinned. 1 John 3.4 says, Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Without the law, you would have no sin. Do we have sin today? Most definitely, and therefore we still have the law with us. But when we're under grace, it's like we're under an umbrella. And we're no longer under the penalty of the law. So we're all under the law. But if we're saved by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we're also covered by God's grace. 
So what is the law? That may seem like a silly question, but whenever tackling a controversial topic, I found it's very helpful to first define your terms. Or you might spend hours in discussion and debate only to find out it was about something you weren't even talking about in the first place. Because we haven't taken time to define our terms. So when someone mentions the law, we need to understand how they are using that term. Even in the Bible, we have to be careful. When a, when a biblical author uses the term the law, sometimes they're referring to the first five books, the Pentateuch or the, the Torah, the first five books written by Moses in the Bible. Sometimes the law is referring to the Ten Commandments. Sometimes it's referring to another group of laws. We have to be able to identify which group is being discussed and how to discern them one from another as well. For example, where did Moses go to get the Ten Commandments? You know, he went to Mount Sinai. We know that. Why? Because Cecil B. DeMille told us so, right? We know Moses uh, and all that, the great movie, right? We know he went to Mount Sinai. But did you know that Moses really got a whole lot of exercise during that time? Exodus uh, chapters 19 to 34 tell us that he went up that mountain at least eight times. And in each of those times, and I looked them up for in preparation for this message, in each of those times, God didn't go down to the base of the mountain. He had Moses go up to the top of the mountain. So that was a lot of exercise he did going up and down eight times. And did you know that in doing so, he brought back four different groups of laws. Four different groups. Not the law, but several groups of the law. The first was the moral law. We know that as the what? The Ten Commandments, right? It's the, it's the written by God on stone law, right? God himself wrote by his own hand, etched in stone, the Ten Commandments. And then there's, there's the civil law. Moses, he wrote these on, those on a scroll. And then there's the ceremonial law, the sacrifices, and the yearly sabbatical feast. And then there's the health law, the cleanliness and diet laws that come in the Bible. Do you know how many commandments are contained in the Ten Commandments? Now that sounds like a really goofy question. There's ten commandments. There ought to be ten of them in there. The problem is that not everybody sees it that way. For instance, some folks love the ten commandments, but they only accept nine of them, right? Which one do they usually leave out? The Sabbath, the fourth commandment. It's like, well, there's a problem there. No other gods, no graven images, honor his name, honor your parents, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't... Don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't covet. These are all valid for most people. But the fourth commandment, the Sabbath day, and to keep it holy, well, that's a stickler for some people. Others believe that the Ten Commandments is actually a small part of the overall ceremonial law, the Mosaic law of ordinances, which ended at the cross. So that means we're no more obligated to keep and obey any of the ten than we are to, say, uh, offer lambs in sacrifice today. So there's different ways of looking at the law and the Ten Commandments. We must ask here, as with anything actually, if we want to know the truth, where do we go? So what says the Scriptures? That needs to be our, our question every single time. What does the Bible say? Moses explained it to the people at Mount Horeb. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, 13 to 14, he said he declared to you his covenant. He's talking about God here. His covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow, and he wrote them on two stone tablets. And the Lord directed me at that time to teach you the decrees and laws you're to follow in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess. Moses is talking about two sets of laws there. The ones which he commanded you to follow from the statutes which the Lord directed me to give the people. But are these statutes and judgments, these things that Moses brought down, passed on to the people, are they designated as separate and distinct purposes, or are they two different groups of laws? God answers that important question in such a way that I don't believe any doubt can remain. In 2 Kings 21, verse 8, he says, I will not again make the feet of the Israelites wander from the land I gave their ancestors, if only they will be careful to do everything I commanded them and will keep the whole law that my servant Moses gave them. So again, he differentiates. God speaks to the law that I commanded and also the law that Moses gave them. And unless this truth is understood properly, great confusion is almost guaranteed. 
Daniel was inspired to make the same careful distinction. In Daniel 9.11, he said, All Israel had transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and the sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we've sinned against you. Once more, we see your law versus the law of Moses. And this time, the two are recognized as very different in content. There are no curses recorded in the Ten Commandments. Think through them. Uh, uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not have no graven images. Think through them. There are no curses. There are no judgments if you don't do them. Right? But there are in the law of Moses. In fact, lots of them in such. The major points of difference between the law of God and the law of Moses, though, lies in the way they were recorded and preserved. Look at Exodus 31.18. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai... He gave him two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. Only two places mentioned, uh, in fact, only one specifically. This one specifically mentions God writing with his finger. We also see the hand writing in, in the, the vision that uh, Daniel had to uh, uh, explain as well. But this is the only place where it says God directly used his hand to create something. No one can confuse this writing with the way the Mosaic law was produced. Deuteronomy 31 says, So Moses wrote down this law, and after Moses finished finished writing in a book the words of this law from beginning to end, he gave this command to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant. If you know anything about the Ark of the Covenant, what was placed in it? The Ten Commandments, the stone tablets that God created were placed in it. This other law, the other part, the law of Moses was set outside the holy of holy places. And there it will remain as a witness against you. So this book of statutes and judgments was placed in a pocket on the side of the ark. And in contrast, the law of God was uh, was placed inside the ark. Exodus 25.16 tells us so. So at this point, we can see several distinctions between these two sets of laws. They had different authors. They were written on different material. They were placed in different locations and they had totally different content as well. So now let's take a closer look at the ceremonial ordinances that Moses wrote that were to rest beside the ark as a witness against you. I think it's interesting to note that the curses and judgments of this law spelled out penalties for transgressions which were totally missing in the Ten Commandments. There are no curses. There are no judgments in the Ten Commandments. In the New Testament, we read the same language here in Colossians 2.14. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. If you've got a King James Bible, it says the handwriting of ordinances, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. One, of, one or both of these groups of laws were nailed to the cross. They were finished. They were completed at the cross. Which ones were it? What, if the, what in the Ten Commandments law could be defined as against us, as against Paul and the church he was writing to? Was it against those early Christ, uh, Christians to refrain from adultery or from theft or lying or murder? No, the moral law was a tremendous protection to them and favored every interest in their lives. We only have to look at Paul's later description of the Ten Commandment law to recognize that those eternal principles were never blotted out. They were never nailed to the cross. After quoting the Tenth Commandment in Romans 7, 7, Paul wrote these words. So then, and read it with me, the law is holy, the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Notice the tense changes in these two passages. Regarding the Ten Commandments, he said the law is holy, is righteous, is good. It remains so. But in contrast, when he talks about the handwriting of ordinances, the ceremonial laws of Moses, he said it it stood against us. It condemned us. One is present tense and very active. The other was past tense. It's no longer active. It is no longer binding on us. Another time, Paul said this in Ephesians 6, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. As a parent, I love this, so I'm going to say it again. Children, obey your parents to the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may go well with you and you may enjoy long life on the earth. Notice he didn't say was, he said is. The fifth commandment is valid today. Had it been a part of the ordinances he wrote about back in Colossians, 
he would have said it was the first commandment with a promise. You know, in the New Testament church, there was a lot of fighting over a lot of things. One of them was circumcision, which was a major requirement of the ceremonial law. In Acts 15, 5, it said, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, they stood up and said that Gentiles have to be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. This could not be referring in any sense to the Ten Commandments. Where in the Ten Commandments is the word circumcision? It's, it's not included. Thank <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness nowhere. Exactly. Good point. They don't even mention circumcision in the Ten Commandments. Yet Paul declared this, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. So if the law that was dealing with circumcision was now nothing, it was abolished, it was finished, it was completed, then what commandments was he exalting is still being binding for us today? There are obviously two laws being referenced here. The moral law remains while the law of circumcision, the ceremonial law, was abolished. Can you agree with me that nothing can be both good and not good at the same time? Yet in Ezekiel we read these words. Ezekiel 20, verse 24 to 25. Because they had not obeyed my laws, but had rejected my decrees, and they desecrated my Sabbaths, and their eyes lusted after their parents' idols. So I gave them other statutes that were not good and laws through which they could not live. Ezekiel begins by identifying the Sabbath law, and then immediately says, I gave them other statutes that weren't good. Remember, the Ten Commandments were called what? Holy, good, just. But because of its curses and judgments against their continual disobedience, the law of Moses was against them and was not good. The eternal moral code that we're talking about has existed since the very beginning of human history. George, that's silly. We know that the Ten Commandments was in Exodus. Uh, you can't say that it was before that. Why not? Follow my logic here. In 1 John 3, 4, it says, Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Romans 4, 15, Because the law brings wrath. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. If you, can't have a, if you don't have a law, you can't have sin. In Romans 7, 7, I would not have known what sin was if it had not been for the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had said, you shall not covet. Long before the Ten Commandments were presented through Moses, Abraham was commended by God with these words. Genesis 26, 5, Because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions. Wait a minute. There were no ceremonial laws at that time. In fact, the Ten Commandments haven't even been shared. What are these laws? It couldn't have been the law of Moses. Galatians 3.17, we won't read it, but as it goes on screen, says that that law wasn't given until 430 years after Abraham. It couldn't have been those laws and commands and decrees and instructions that Abraham was honoring. What was it? In verse 10 of Galatians 3, he says, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. And as it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Again, this had to be the Mosaic law because there are no curses recorded anywhere in the entire set of the Ten Commandments. Earlier, Joseph had revealed that he was aware of the binding claims of that same law when he said to Potiphar's wife, remember Potiphar's wife had come to him and tried to uh, uh, engage him in an act of adultery, and he said no, but look at his answer. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? He knew that this was adultery. He knew that adultery was a sin. He knew that it would be breaking God's law. It was already in place long before the Ten Commandments were printed and, on, and etched in stone. Cain. Cain sinned when he murdered his brother Abel. Look at Genesis 4-7. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Sin is almost with you right now. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. At that very point in time, Cain was thinking of killing his brother Abel. Jesus said that if you have hate in your heart against your brother, you're committing murder. And God is warning him, sin is crouching right outside your door. Don't let it take you. But sin was there, which means the law was there. And of course, we know that Adam sinned. Romans 5.12 said, when Adam sinned, 
sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. So Abraham and Joseph and Cain and Adam, they, they all sinned, the Bible says. Yet long before Moses brought down the two stone tablets to the people, the moral code, the moral law was always here from the beginning of time. So Paul also tells us in Galatians 3 what the purpose of the ceremonial law, the Mosaic law, the the law that was brought separate to and from the moral law. Galatians 3.19, why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. Here we're told why it was given and how long it's going to remain in effect. First, why it was given because of transgressions. Remember the verse we read earlier, without law, there can be no transgressions. You can't break something that doesn't exist. And this is very revealing because we just saw that. You can't be guilty of transgressing a law that doesn't exist. In this case, one law obviously did exist and it had been transgressed. And since it's recorded that Abraham obeyed my laws, we have to believe that the earlier law which Abraham observed was the moral law. Moses had not yet even been born it definitely could could not also have been his law. Kind of makes sense, right? I mean, think about it. If a law is made forbidding murder and it's broken, then another law would have to be enacted giving the punishment for breaking that first law. We already established the Ten Commandments contain no curses, no, no penalties, if you will, or judgments and punishments, but the Mosaic Law was filled with both. So how long was this going to remain in effect? Till the seed had come. Everybody agrees the seed referenced here is Jesus Christ. But the law which was blotted out, nailed to the cross, was it the law of Moses? Or was it the Ten Ten Commandments? Let's look closer at that text in Colossians to see what was actually canceled as we get near to closing here. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. I need to point out something right there in the middle of that passage, the word therefore. And we've talked about this over and over. When you see the word therefore, what do we do there? We want to see what it's there for. We've got to go backwards, right? Therefore means based on what was just said, we must come to this conclusion. So, in effect, he's saying, based upon the fact that the charges which stood against us and condemned us are now canceled, therefore, let no one judge you about what to eat or drink. Is there anything in the Ten Commandments talking about eating or drinking? No. Now, the rest of the text reads this, Therefore, don't let anyone judge you with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. And some would say, aha, and this would be a great time to interject about it, except we're not going to. And it may seem like a cop-out, but I promise you we will revisit this issue again in a couple weeks when we turn to the challenges that I'm hoping you guys will give me. I, I really need to hear what challenges you've heard from or maybe have gone through your own head and your own heart about the Sabbath. Yeah, but what about the? Bring those forward together and we will look at them at the last week. In closing, it may interest you to you know that some notable Bible scholars like Adam Clark, Dwight Moody, D, uh, Dr. C.I. Schofield, Billy Graham, all agree that Paul is not talking here that, about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, the moral law, was not nailed to the cross, but instead it was the law that Paul said that was abolished, the ceremonial law. Remember that earlier story I told about the farmer? Well, when the father did return home, everything was completed and he inspected the work that the son had done. He immediately noticed something was off. He noticed the well was not located as planned. He asked his son about the change and the son explained about all the extra work that would go in because it was extra steep and further from the house, so he moved it to make it better. Well, the father had, in fact, taken all that into consideration to begin with. See, he hadn't told the son this, but he was going to run plumbing down into the house. In fact, it would have been the first house with running water in the entire area. He had planned it so that the well was higher than the house, and so it would be easy to run water into the house. 
But now, with the drop in elevation of the new location of the well, water would still need to be brought to the house and livestock the old way, two buckets at a time. Many times, God gives us instructions he does not fully explain. Sometimes he simply wants to know if we're willing to obey him. Sometimes he realizes we can't understand or comprehend why. Sometimes he's planned a blessing for us that he wishes to give all who are willing to obey, even though they may not understand. The moral law was given by God from the beginning of time. It remains for us today, as it will forevermore, because it represents the very character of God the Father. Jesus said long ago, and it still applies us today, if you love me, keep my commands. Let's pray. Father God, as we prepare ourselves for a study on your Sabbath, what it means, what it meant for believers of old, and what it means for believers today, we have to first look at what it means to know the law. Is the law valid for today? And I think as we've seen over scripture today, a portion of that law, the moral law, your moral law that you gave on Mount Sinai, that you etched in stone with your very finger. Father God, that is just as much alive today as it was when when Adam was in this world and it will be to the end of time because it's a representation of your very character. And Father God, we need to remember that there are a lot of ways to respond to the law. You can toss it aside, you can ignore it, or you can do as Jesus asked and keep them. You can keep his commandments. And Jesus points out the number one reason because it shows that we truly, truly love him. We put all of our lives, all of our assets, all of our family and relationships into his hands. And in doing so, we rely on his will and we only know his will by knowing his law. Because again, the law is what points out when we're going against your will, Father God. Help us to remember that in the weeks to come. That we don't look at the law as something foreign or something bad or something outdated, but in fact it was designed by you not to save us, but to point out that we need a Savior. That it points out when we were failing you, when we were falling away from the way that you would have us go. Father, not, do not let us look at the law as something to, um, to ignore, but something to hold on to, to understand, to realize where, where you are leading us and guiding us. And Father, in the weeks to come, may we have a better understanding of what your expectations are for us in worship and in praise and in obedience. And it's all of these things I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen.